Well, guys, for week two of our series called The Hot Seat, we're going to jump into a topic that has had a ton of debate. I mean, over the course of the centuries, there's been a lot of heated conversation regarding this topic. And so as we dive in, I want us to just first make a commitment to each other that we're not going to bring our presuppositions to the, to the text, meaning we're not going to read into it what we already believe. Instead, let's be open-minded about what the scriptures have to say and let the scriptures speak for themselves. The second thing that I want us to be committed to is to having a holistic view of scripture, meaning we need to take it as a whole. We don't take just one piece and, and base our whole theology off of one passage of scripture. So as we read through this, as we read through several passages of scripture here, I hope that we will have a, a better idea regarding the topic that is at hand tonight. And so tonight we're going to talk about the role of women in ministry. I've had several of you guys ask me about this um, in person. Several people have asked me online, what is the role of women in ministry? Can women be pastors? And so I hope that as we dive in today, we'll have a better idea and a better picture of what uh, the role is for women in the local church. So if you have your Bible, go ahead and open up. We're going to start off in 1 Corinthians. There's really uh, like three main passages of scripture that will inform our view of what a woman's role is in ministry. Guys, don't check out on me, by the way. I know that we're talking about women in ministry, but this is applicable for you guys as well, because you may be serving in the local church one day, or you may, uh, by God's grace, be married one day. And so this is going to be important for you, but also it's important because ultimately we are all part of the body of Christ and we have to serve alongside each other. And so recognizing what our individual roles are uh, is going to help us all to be better at what we are called to do. So the, the kind of the different um, passages that will inform our view are 1 Corinthians chapter 11, 1 Corinthians 14, and 1 Timothy chapter 2. These are really going to give us kind of a better picture uh, for what a woman's role is in the church. So if you have your Bible, 1 Corinthians chapter 11, and we're going to look at verse 5 to start off with. Uh, but before we jump in, I want us to understand what um, really the purpose or the theme is for chapter 11. In chapter 11, Paul is writing to the church in Corinth, and he is talking about what is uh, proper in worship. He's talking about what's, pr what's proper when the believers are gathered together, or what we commonly know that as to not, uh, today is church. But what's proper for the church? So with that in mind, what, with having this view of what's right and what's proper for the church, let's go ahead and read. We're going to read just real quick verse 5. Chapter 11, 1 Corinthians 11, verse 5. He says, And every woman who prays or prophesies with her head uncovered dishonors her head. It is just as though her head were shaved. Now, this passage also kind of goes into the whole thing about should women wear head coverings? Is long hair just sufficient for that? But what I want us to, to key in on here is that women have a role. Women have a role in the local church. Look at what the two actions are that Paul talks about women taking. It says that women, um, who, if a woman prays or prophesies, right? So he's not saying women should not pray or prophesy. He's saying that these are things that women do, but there's a right way to do it. Now, we all know what praying is, right? It's talking with God. It's having a, a conversation with God. And so I think we all have a, at least a decent idea of what prayer is. But what is prophecy? Prophecy, according to the Vine's Concise Dictionary, uh, it states that the original Greek word for prophecy means telling forth the divine counsels. Now, if that made it clear as mud for you, same with me. So I had to look it up a little bit more to understand what does it mean, the divine counsels? Like what is telling forth the divine counsels? Well, basically it's declaring things that can only be known by divine revelation. And so what does that look like? How does that play out nowadays? You know, back in those days, God would give special revelation to people. He would give special 
prophecy to people, and those people were called prophets, right? They had the ability to prophesy, to speak on behalf of God. Well, nowadays we have right here the Bible, the, the canon of Scripture, and it's closed. You see, God is not giving any new revelation anymore. He's already given it all to us right here. This is totally sufficient for everything that we need in regards to godliness and being mature in Christ. And so when we talk about prophecy nowadays, what this looks like is sharing the truths of Scripture. It's sharing the gospel. It's speaking to others what God's truth is as revealed in Scripture. And so ultimately, it comes down to Scripture, not revealing something new, not saying, hey, you know, I think that God has given me a special word for you. No, no, no. What he's saying is that uh, women can prophesy, can share the truths of God's word. And so in a sense, prophesying is, is a lot like preaching in that it is proclaiming the word of God. It, it's, it's proclaiming the truth of God as revealed in Scripture. So there we have two things that we see women doing in the local assembly, praying and prophesying. Okay, now flip on over to 1 Corinthians chapter 14. So just flip over a couple of pages there. 1 Corinthians 14, and we're going to be in verse 34. Now here we see Paul kind of goes a little bit deeper into what is um, allowed or what is the role of a woman in the church. Now, understand this passage of scripture, he's again addressing orderly worship within the corporate gathering of believers. So here, starting in, let's go ahead and start in verse 33. It says, for God is not a God of disorder, but of peace. And then it starts a new paragraph here. It says, as in all the congregations of the saints, verse 34, women should remain silent in the churches they are not allowed to speak, but must be in submission, as the law says. And then keep going on. It says, if they want to inquire about something, they should ask their own husbands at home. For it is, a dis it is disgraceful for a woman to speak in the church. So here we see that women should learn in quietness. They should learn in submission, um, that they should uh, be silent and learn silently, that they shouldn't ask questions um, in the gathered assembly, but that they should maybe ask questions instead after the assembly has dismissed. Now, you might be thinking, wait a second, Pastor Joe. I, I thought you said that women were praying and prophesying, and now they're supposed to be quiet, and that's only three chapters later. What's going on here? Well, first, we've got to understand the rationale that is given for, for why women should be silent in the local gathering in, in this way, that they should learn silently. The rationale that he gives for this is that he references the law. He says in verse um, in verse 34, he says, women should remain silent in the churches. They are not allowed to speak, but must be in submission, key in submission, as the law says. Now, what is what is this law that he's talking about? Well, it's actually referencing back to the book of Genesis, when Adam and Eve sinned, and God handed down judgment on Adam and on Eve. And they both were cursed, right? There was this curse that was, was given by God. And the curse uh, against women is that they would be submissive to their husbands. And so he's referencing back to basically almost the beginning of time when this curse was placed on women after the fall. Now, when we look at chapter 11, verse 5, and we look at chapter 14, verse 34, it seems clear that women could pray in public gatherings, as, as well as declare the truths of God, but that they should take up a posture of quiet learning otherwise, and they shouldn't question what is being spoken until after the assembly has been dismissed. This is to in order to not cause a disruption. This is in order to uh, help keep the peace, right? He said here in verse 33, for God is not a God of disorder, but of peace. And so there is some culture at play here, right? That that oftentimes the men were more well-educated than the women. And so the women might speak up and ask questions to try to understand, and it could cause a disruption. But he also references back even to almost the beginning of time. So that way we know that this isn't just a cultural command or a cultural edict, but this is a, a, a command for all time. So here we have women can pray 
and prophesy in the church, but otherwise it should take up a position or a posture of quiet learning and not question what's being spoken until after the assembly has been dismissed. Okay, now I'm glad you guys are hanging with me. We're going to hop on over now to 1 Timothy, okay? Hop on over to 1 Timothy. We're going to look at chapter 2, verse 11. Here we go. A woman should learn in quietness and full submission. I do not permit a woman to teach or to have authority over a man. She must be silent for Adam was formed first, then Eve. And Adam was not the one deceived. It was the woman who was deceived and became a sinner. So here we have now he's speaking into what a woman should do. He kind of clarifies a little bit more, right? So women are allowed to uh, pray. They're allowed to prophesy in the, the gathering of the believers. But here he gives a little bit further instruction. Women should learn in quietness and in submission. It says here that women should not teach or have authority over men, that they should be silent. Now, the rationale given for this, again, is referencing the creation order. It's going back to the book of Genesis, that Adam was created first and then Eve before sin, that there was this hierarchy of creation order. And so we've got to understand, people oftentimes will look at this passage of scripture and try to say, oh, it's cultural. It's a cultural command. But by referencing the pre-fall, the, the, before sin entered the world, Paul is trying to make it clear to us that this is a command for all time. This isn't just a cultural command just for uh, the church that uh, Timothy was pastoring. And so um, we have to clarify some of the terms here, though. So we know that this is a command for all time. But here it says, I do not permit a woman to teach or to have authority over a man, that she must be silent. Now, we have to understand what teaching is, because so often in our context nowadays, in our modern church context, preaching and teaching have kind of become combined. It's almost like they've been become the same thing. But when we look at the pages of scripture, we see that Jesus went around and he preached and taught, that he did both of those things. So clearly there's a distinction. There's something different between these two things. The teaching is imparting instruction or it's in explaining something or it's instilling doctrine. It's imparting instruction, it's explaining a concept, or it's instilling doctrine. Women should not teach, they shouldn't explain to or instruct or instill doctrine to men because that would assume a role of authority, which really upends the curse that God placed on women at the fall, and it upends the pre-fall order of creation that God had uh, ordered for a, a woman, the wife, or women in general, to be in submission to uh, their husbands or to the man. And so um, we've got to understand that this comes down to this creation order. So what's the difference? What's the difference between preaching and teaching? Teaching is, is uh, instructing, it's instilling doctrine. And we said that prophesying and preaching are, are very similar. And, and it's really because prophesying and preaching are proclamations. It, it's a proclamation of the truths of God. But teach, teaching is more education. If preaching is proclamation, teaching is education. If preaching is announcing, then teaching is instructing. Another good way to think of it is that preaching is making a declaration and teaching is making a disciple. A pastor that I really look up to, his name is uh, John Piper, talked about it this way, that if a man were to come into a town or a person were to come into a town back in, you know, like medieval days, and he was coming in and he would, he would shout out, he would say, hear ye, hear ye, the king is coming. And he would make a proclamation of what the king has said. And so he would, he would declare the truth of the king. So that is the preaching part. The teaching part comes afterwards where someone might come and say, uh, well, you said that we are uh, no longer slaves, that, that all slavery is done away with. When does that take effect? And a slave owner might come up and say, well, uh, will I be compensated for the loss of my slaves? And so there's a, you know, a preaching side of saying there's no more slavery. And then there's the teaching side of explaining in further detail what 
that means. So we have these things explained. We have really what the role of women is in the church, right? There is praying, there's prophesying. There's, it says that you know they can teach, but not teach men, right? So you could teach children, you could teach other women. These are things that women can do in the church. But when it comes down to really the big question, the one that people ask me oftentimes is, can women be pastors in the church? We have to say the answer is actually no. Women cannot be pastors in the church. If you have your Bible, flip over. You're in 1 Timothy. You should be in 1 Timothy right now. Flip over a page over to 1 Timothy chapter 3, where Paul gives the, um, I guess, kind of the qualifications of what a pastor needs to be, of who can be a pastor. If you look at 1 Timothy 3, starting in verse 2, really all you have to do is look at verse 2. Here it tells us, now the overseer, pause, overseer in scripture is the same as an elder, is the same as a pastor. So when you see the term elder or overseer or pastor in scripture, those are three different words for the same office in the church. So let's go on forward. Now the overseer must be above reproach, the husband of but one wife, temperate, self-controlled, respectable, hospitable, able to teach. And so you look at this and there's two things that really stand out about what disqualify women from being pastors in the church. The first is it says husband of but one wife. What this literally translates to is a one woman man, a man who is married to one woman. And so there's debate about what this means. Can a guy be divorced and then remarried? Does it mean that you just can't engage in polygamy? We could go on and on about that. But it makes it very clear that this is talking about men, that the overseers are to be men, husbands of but one wife. The other thing here is it says they must be, be able to teach. Now, this doesn't mean that women aren't maybe able to teach. Most of my teachers growing up in school were women. But what this means is that you have to be able to teach to the general congregation. And as we just saw earlier, it says that Paul, uh, Paul wrote that he did not permit a woman to teach or to assert authority over men. In the general assembly of the church, since women were forbidden from teaching men, this requirement also disqualifies women from the office of pastor. And so, ladies, you might be sitting here thinking, well, goodness gracious, what, what am I able to do? How am I able to participate in the church? Well, we have several things that we can look at here. The first is that you can be servants of the church, right? You look at the book of Romans. In Romans chapter 16, um, Paul is writing to the church in Rome, and he commends a particular woman. Look what it says, Romans 16, verse 1. He says, I commend to you our sister Phoebe, a servant of the church and Sencria. She's a servant of the church. We have women who serve in our church in a very similar role to what Phoebe did, leading ministries under the direction of a pastor. You have people like Jessica Sink or Tawana Kuntz or Katie Stutlers. They're examples of this. Jessica leads our children's ministry. Tawana leads the preschool ministry, and Katie leads the women's ministry, yet they are all under the authority of Pastor Mitch and Pastor Jeff. There are some other ladies in the church who serve in this similar capacity. You have Elizabeth and Taylor and Wanda. There's other ladies who work in the office and use their spiritual and their natural gifts to serve the church under the authority of Pastor Kevin. We also have ladies sitting here in the room with us who serve as our tribe leaders. And, and this is an example of serving in the church under the leadership of the student pastor, me, and under the direction of Pastor Jeff. And so, uh, ladies, you are able to serve the church in mighty and powerful and important and influential ways in the local church. Another way that ladies can serve in the church, in the congregation of believers, is by proclaiming the good news to the lost. Or in other words, being missionaries. Look with me at John chapter 20. This is right after Jesus was resurrected from the dead. And the first person who saw him was Mary Magdalene, a woman. And so look what she does. In verse 18, it says, Mary Magdalene went to the disciples 
with the news. And she said, I have seen the Lord. And she told them that he had said these things to her, that he, she tells them what he had said. She's proclaiming the truth of what she knows about Christ. So she was a missionary in that sense to the disciples because they had not yet seen the resurrected Christ. So ladies, you are always welcome to go. In fact, I encourage you, go and proclaim the good news to the lost. Be a missionary. Ladies in high school and in middle school right now, be a missionary to your school. If you look for examples of people who have done things like this, look at Lottie Moon, who was a prominent missionary for the Southern Baptist Convention, and she served in China for over 40 years. Another lady that I admire is Elizabeth Elliott. She was a missionary who ministered to the Waroni tribes in Ecuador. And this tribe actually killed her husband, who was also a missionary uh, to the Waroni people. And she stayed and she made it her mission to love them, even though they killed her husband, because she wanted to reach them for the gospel. Another lady that you can look to as a, as a source of inspiration is uh, Katie Davis, who is actually a current missionary in Uganda, Africa. She started a parachurch, parachurch ministry called Amazima Ministries, uh, and it seeks to reach the young people of Uganda. So there are many ways that ladies can serve in the local church. I know that when we read this and we, we see things about you know men's authority and things like that, it, it can almost seem like, well, is there anything that women can do? Can women have any sort of prominent role or authority? And the answer is yes. Now, when it comes to the office of pastor, no, God made it very clear that that is an office that is meant for men, but there are other many, many powerful ways that women can serve in the local church. So guys, ultimately at the end of the day, I want us to come back to 1 Corinthians chapter 12. 1 Corinthians chapter 12, uh, because it, it gives us the, the, the real point of it all, right? That we are all part of the same body. L would you read with me? 1 Corinthians 12 verses 12 through 26. It says the body is a unit, though it is made up of many parts, and although uh, and though all its parts are many, they form one body. So it is with Christ. For we were all baptized by one spirit into one body, whether Jews or Greeks, slave or free, and we were all given one spirit to drink. Now, the body is not made up of one part, but of many. If the foot should say, because I am not a hand, I do not belong to the body, it would not, for that reason, cease to be part of the body. And if the ear should say, I am not an eye, so I do not belong to the body, it would not, for that reason, cease to be part of the body. If the whole person were an eye, where would be the sense of hearing? If the whole body were an ear, where would be the sense of smell? But in fact, God has arranged the parts of the body, every one of them, just as he wanted them to be. And if there were all one part, where would the body be? As it is, there are many parts, but one body. The eye cannot say to the hand, I don't need you. And the head cannot say to the feet, I don't need you. On the contrary, those parts of the body that seem to be weaker are indispensable. And the parts that we think are less honorable, we treat with special honor. And the parts that are unpresentable, we treat with special modesty, while our presentable parts need no special treatment. But God has combined the members of the body and has given greater honor to the parts that lacked it, so that there would be no division in the body, but that its parts should have equal concern for each other. If one part suffers, every part suffers with it. If one part is honored, every part rejoices with it. Y'all, we are all part of the same body. We are all part of the body of Christ, men and women. doesn't matter what country, nationality, what color your skin is. It, it, we are all part of the same body, but we all have different roles that we play. Men and women have different roles that we play within the local church, but each role is equally important is equally valid and is equally necessary. Ladies, without you, the church would not thrive. Men, without you, the church would not thrive. We need men and women serving in the roles that God has given to us, that God has uniquely equipped each of us for. 
in order for the church to be healthy. Guys, we should not strive after a role that is not ours to have, but we should humbly and gratefully accept the role that we have. And understand that not every man is called to be a pastor. And just like every woman is not called to serve in children's ministry, there are many different roles for every person to have. But what we need to do is assess our spiritual gifts. We need to assess our natural gifts, as well as the biblical commands, like what we read in scripture today from 1 Corinthians and from 1 Timothy. So that way we can serve the church the way that God has called us to, for God's glory and for the benefit of a lost and dying world. So guys, I just hope that you're encouraged. And ladies, I hope that you are particularly encouraged that the church would not be able to survive without you. And I know that you might read through some of these things and it might kind of rub a little bit wrong of like this whole, you know, will men have the authority? And, and does that mean that women are just supposed to be quiet and sitting in the corner? By no means. I, I mean, women, we need women who are bold, women who are going to help uh, push the the rock forward so that way the church can advance on the gates of hell. Guys, I am so glad to be able to serve alongside the ladies in our church, as well as the other pastors in our church, in order to see the gospel proclaimed. So I hope you're encouraged. I hope that reading through these passages of scripture helps clarify some of what a woman's role is in the church. And for the guys here, I hope that you're encouraged and that you take up your role seriously as well, because you're part of the body too. It's not just about the women uh, not being the pastors, but it's about us guys stepping up and leading as well. So we need to work together to see God glorified and to see his good news proclaimed to the ends of the earth. Would you guys pray with me? God, thank you so much for your word. And Lord, I Although it's hard for us to understand everything that is written in Scripture, it's hard for us to understand every biblical command, Lord, I just pray that you would open up our hearts to your way. God, we are going to submit to you in saying that your way is best. We're going to submit to you in saying that your word is what guides our lives. And so, God, although there is so much uh, that competes for our attention and our and our understanding of philosophy and theology, God, we are just going to say a simple understanding of your scriptures is enough for us. Holy Spirit, guide us, open up our hearts and our minds to receive the truth. And Lord, if there's anything that I've said tonight that is not of you, may it fall on deaf ears, because I don't want this to be about me in any way, shape, or form. I want this to be about your word and about what is good for your church as you have prescribed it. So God, we praise you. We we honor your name and we are committed to seeing the gospel proclaimed. It's in your name we pray, Jesus. Amen. Hey.